Hello and welcome to the second panel of the FinFellas crowdfunding event after this nice discussion led by David earlier this day. The title of this panel is Dealing with Defaults, How Platforms Handle Their Losses. And uh, for the audience, if you have any questions to the attendees of this panel, please write it into the chat and um, we will use it later for the Q&A session. And also for you guys, if you have questions under each other, please, please ask and make this discussion more active. It's your chance um, to learn a bit more about other companies and how they handle their stuff. So before we start with the content, I would like to ask you for a brief introduction of yourself and uh, your company. Um, just very short from my side, I'm Lars, I'm an online entrepreneur and investor and built up the biggest German peer-to-peer -peer investor community in the last years and try to develop this industry. And for this session, I will be your moderator. And um, now let's come to our panel crew. Let's start with uh, Martinez. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Martinez. I'm a CEO for real estate crowdfunding platform Röntgen. We specialize in real estate development financing. So most of our projects are uh, fairly large, uh, usually over half a million euro uh, size loans that are backed with real estate collateral. Uh, although for, for three years, we still don't have any bad loans in our portfolio, neither late nor in default. But uh, we still had some uh, market uh, research on how things should be handled, as well as had some situations where we had to step in in order for loans not to go into being late or default. So maybe I'll have something to share about our experience. Okay, thanks for that. Yours? Uh, uh, hi. Um... I'm glad to be here. Uh, I am a manager of um, Pond Baltic um, uh, company Capitalia. What we do, we have been funding uh, for um, 13 years, uh, small and medium sized businesses here across Baltics. And over the last three years, uh, one of the ways how we um, perform, execute this funding is through a closed network of, uh, of uh, private investors in a way, through a closed syndication or closed uh, crowdfunding. Um, unlike Martin, it seems like I have a pretty long, long track record of these uh, uh, defaults, unfortunately. So I have um, uh, uh, this is uh, this is a way how um, we as um, as a lenders have uh, learned a lot, and uh, over the 13 years uh, there are quite plenty of uh, definitely more than I would like experiences on on uh, how to deal with defaults accumulated. Okay, but it's good, so you can you can talk a lot of it. So, Ali? Uh, me, sorry? Yeah. Um, I think he said me, but you can go ahead. <laughs> hey, thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, well, my, my, my name is Anatolis. Uh, I am a CEO at uh, Crowdstore. Mm, uh, well, basically, we are a business crowdfunding platform. Uh, we've been on the market since, uh, since 2017. Uh, have funded around uh, 360 projects uh, in different kind of a business segments. Uh, we have real estate, we have specialized projects. Those are the ones interesting, kind of a movies, uh, games, and so on. Uh, so basically, non-standardized product. And also, we, we, we finance the uh, uh, SMEs, small to medium enterprises. Mm, um, yes, that's, that's in short, I guess. Yeah, and also uh, kind of a, as Yudis uh, and Martinez uh, uh, mentioned, so basically in, in the context of defaults, I guess uh, we are more like Yudis uh, than Martinez. So we, we are dealing with defaults at, at uh, we, we don't have so much experience as Yudis, but uh, uh, we are dealing with them now. Uh, so there are plenty of work uh, for us now in, the, in this context. Thank you. So now the last one. Hello, everybody. My name's Ali. I'm founder and CEO of British Pearl, a property investment platform in the UK. We enable investors to invest in real estate online, where an investor can select the real estate that they'd like to invest in, um, uh, i.e. it is not a commingled fund. Investors can invest either as um, a lender, um, I provide a mortgage, uh, first charge against re residential real estate and receive fixed interest returns on a monthly basis. 
or they can purchase the equity and receive monthly dividends and any share of any capital gains over a number of years. We've invested a lot in our technology and operations uh, for automation and improved customer experience. Um, as a result, we've developed an, an online, uh, a platform that enables online origination and secondary trading of um, uh, equity and debt um, securities, which are backed by real estate. Thank you. It sounds interesting. So thank you all. And first of all, I want to know from you if um, you have had any defaults so far in your companies and platforms and um, what was the outcome that you can share some stories from yourself and we can stay with Ali for the first time. Uh, sure. Um, actually, the default scenario is much more relevant to the other platforms that, than mine. Um, I have uh, in our particular business model at the moment, because what we do is we um, source the real estate ourselves. We set up the SPVs. Um, we fund the initial purchase uh, and then we essentially refinance with our investor community and we continue to manage the SPV and investment ourselves over time. So uh, as opposed to getting investors uh, and uh, finding a third party and acting as the middleman, um, we are actually the principal um, borrower on the other side ourselves. Um, so what really matters in our business model is ensuring that the property is tenanted and uh, um, generating income. So uh, in our business model, we take away third party risk. Uh, in previous um, uh, business models, um, uh, such as I, I set up a consumer lending platform, um, the experience is in subprime where the defaults are high. Um, so unsecured consumer credit in the subprime area, so micro loans, um, defaults are, uh, are much more common in that area, hence the high interest rates, um, because they assume that you, there's going to be a part of your book that you, you never get um, uh, that money back. In that scenario, we had a number of steps in order to assist with recovery. Um, but the first step we've always found uh, that we should be concentrating on most and last in the longest in terms of duration is actually trying to work with the borrower to get them to make payments over time. Um, so take a soft approach rather than too hard an approach and really encourage and enable people uh, to make the repayments. After that, then you can go into, you know, legal process, debt collection, external debt collection companies and final resort um, uh, to court, but nobody enjoys that. And um, it's also non-economic on micro loans. Um, you need to be very careful how much cost you're incurring in order to get those funds back. It makes a lot more sense for larger business loans, as I'm sure um, Capitalia, for example, uh, experiences. Thank you. Thanks for that. Maybe yours, you want to continue? I mean, yeah, I mean, Ali was spot on. Uh, that's exactly, a f you're always navigating a soft line between what's a um, hard approach and soft approach. And uh, when uh, when working with the smaller loans, and again, it depends by organization, how you define it, what's a micro loan was and also business segment, and what's not, you generally want to be pretty standardized. You cannot be, you know, uh, have a too flexible structure where you negotiate and renegotiate with everybody. But uh, generally, all loans that are above 25,000, at least for our context, we would consider them big and they would uh, first time to do a workout, in a sense, uh, finding a soft solution while um, um, having something in, um, yeah, you know, at least always having this uh, legal setup ready so that you can go the hard way too. So it's always more lenient on the big cases. With regards to our experience, yes, we had um, we have quite, quite long uh, Again, experience of dealing is with defaults, uh, especially on the smaller loans, so on micro loans. That is, I think, statistical inevitability. If you do them, uh, you are going to get them. Uh, with regards to larger cases um, and the ones that we have co-founded with uh, through this crowdfunding, we have one default, and I think we had about five or six workout situations, uh, of which three have concluded successfully, and three are still ongoing. Um, so. I hope that that answers the question. Okay, Martinez. sorry, can I, 
question. Um, it's interesting. How how long does does it take to kind of enforce the uh, the late payment? I mean, um, to enforce a late payment, I mean, if you go in hard collection, um, that's uh, thirty to sixty days to get uh, some sort of uh, arrest um, or um, sort of fixture or control of um, asset. But you know, actually, if that's why you know the especially in large cases, these uh, hard collections are are always you know um, it's definitely not a preferred route. Uh, first of all, uh, hard collection is uh, is um, uh, well unpleasant on on many fronts, um, but um, also uh, it is very long and uh, technically complicated. There is a lot of um, sort of legal costs that could be involved, and generally with the higher the default amount, the more resistance, um, if especially the other party is unfriendly, you can expect. So, um, for example, last case, that uh, the, the, the only case that has actually defaulted from the crowdfunding case, that there was a, was a collateral and the um, uh, collateral on, on land, for example, right? And until we could get from default moment until uh, the land was sold in auction, and that is with condition where the sort of the other party was cooperating that took five or six months just a question from my side with hard collection you mean uh, going into the code yes okay soft is uh, the one who's right to negotiate something out as it is a client yeah we will come later to this point also so <laughs> yeah. but maybe we, yeah uh, uh, just just yeah uh, just a, a new definition i mean uh, hard and soft uh, yeah, I, I I just uh, operated with the with the pre cord and then cord. Um, I'm not a lawyer yet since um, we we are very much into it. If if I may have a word, so um, it is a very painful topic for for us at CrowdStore since uh, we are a business crowdfunding platform and uh, now uh, due to because of crisis, um, of course, um, uh, much uh, m many many. And, uh, overwhelming majority of the of our clients uh, businesses borrowers uh, they experience troubles financial difficulties and and uh, that's revealed um, several um, several fundamental um, issues um, that we have uh, so basically uh, the first one uh, is the individual approach so basically what you just mentioned uh, we we at, at the moment, uh, I, I think still we go more uh, kind of a, a soft approach, uh, which has proven to be not the 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 best uh, the best way to deal with uh, those in uh, delay. Um, I mean, uh, those those borrowers that don't pay uh, according to the schedule. Uh, so basically, we now uh, communicating a lot uh, with uh, our investors, and they say that. Um, okay, guys, um, it, it is enough, you know, uh, you try to negotiate, but it's time to go to the court. And uh, uh, it happens that uh, in many cases, actually, uh, since we are in a very kind of a difficult uh, segment of crowdfunding, we don't have the uh, only real estate when there is a uh, clear and straightforward uh, debt collection process, just realize, re realization, uh, the selling of the real estate um, as a collateral. Uh, we uh, do have uh, different kind of pledges, uh, commercial pledges on the shares, for example. Uh, and so we uh, deal on a, a, a daily basis with situations with those borrowers who don't pay according to the schedule, uh, who where, where we see that uh, it is not in the best interests uh, of investors to just default, since uh, the investors may not get anything from the from the from the borrower, and then we try to negotiate, and then we try to find the best uh, possible solution, uh, um, uh, trying to 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 protect investors. But um, um, as the matter of fact, um, it turns out that um, it is not the best uh, way to approach this uh, the, 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 these this. Uh, Kind of issues um, since um, since uh, yeah you are the one who basically you are the platform uh, you as a middleman uh, you were should not be uh, this is my strong kind of belief that you should not be a decision maker uh, decision maker should be investors those uh, who has uh, kind of um, their skin in the game 
and so then our our task and main uh, main uh, target is to uh, provide as much information uh, and as clear and understandable and standardized debt collection process um, uh, as we can. So basically, so that our investors uh, decide on their own. Now we, we, we have developed a functionality, um, we call it investor meeting or uh, voting. Um, if I may say so, so basically just 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 giving out all the information we've got from the borrower now together with our due diligence and together with our analysis so that investors uh, decide what to do with the borrower and uh, this is basically uh, what we will do in in large amounts since we have we have a number of delayed projects um, who are delayed in the, who are late more than sixty more than ninety days. Um, we, we've tried since since those are the borrowers that uh, we've got uh, in the early stage of the uh, living of the platform. I mean, of the life of the platform. And we felt romantic uh, about them, and uh, also when when we see that uh, defaulting is not the best and going to going to court is not the best um, way in terms of the receiving the funds from the borrower, we we do kind of a, we do make it soft. I mean. I mean, uh, and w which which we see that uh, uh, is not uh, is not good in terms of our reputation. That's why we are very much um, working on our debt collection procedure. Uh, we've been working on it uh, since um, since I became a COO at Crowdster. Um, this is very critical uh, point and topic uh, for our reputation. Um, uh, we see it this way, and uh, next week. Uh, on 4th of March, uh, I will be presenting kind of a um, um, debt collection procedure, the new debt collection procedure, a well thought one, and uh, as we call it, no mercy uh, style debt collection procedures. So basically, no, 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 no mercy to those who don't pay their investors. We will be strict. Um, do you mind, uh, Lars? Do you mind if I ask Anatol uh, Anatolia a question? Um, uh, Anatoly, your business model um, is um, lending to businesses, correct? Yeah, to businesses, right. Yeah. Uh, and it's a loan, it's not equity investment. Is that right? It, at the moment, it, it is a loan. And, and you take, um, do you take, presumably you take security over the business assets. Do you do that? So, uh, yeah, uh, there are different, uh, there are different, uh, project types, as we call it. So basically, small to medium enterprises with the uh, standardized risk assessment. Um, uh, we take there, uh, as a collateral, a private guarantee from the from the uh, shareholders of the borrower of the company. Uh, so we have also specialized projects when there may happen everything. So basically, we, we, can, we can have a commercial pledge on stock, we have a commercial pledge on shares, uh, we have uh, we have been experienced cases when there is a mortgage, and also we have real estate uh, with uh, with a real uh, with a mortgage as a collateral. So is that real estate would that be uh, real estate owned by the business or the director and shareholders or both? Uh, both. It can be both. Okay. Um, so it sounds like you take adequate security. So in terms of bad defaults. Um, do you, do you publish that information? Uh, uh, by the way, I'm not trying to catch you out. I just find this very interesting um, yeah. because we're going through, um, you know, as we know, we're going through an unprecedented time at the moment. Um, and I, I imagine that this has uh, probably increased the default. What's going on in the market has increased the defaults in businesses, um, uh, which is your primary target audience in terms of loans that you're providing. Um, but, you know, if you're providing loans with sufficient security uh, attached to them, um, although it must be a pain going through the process of working with the borrower and the legal process of trying to get uh, access to the investors' funds, um, if you've got adequate security, you should still be in a good position, right, um, at the end of the day. Um, so, um, right. uh, at, the, at the moment, uh, have you seen quite a... Uh, an increase in the amount of companies um, that um, are, are late to pay or, or defaulting 
And also, just one last question uh, with, in relation to that. Um, uh, in the UK, we have a lot of government schemes that are trying to support companies, both the supporting of the payroll through something called a furlough system and supporting businesses direct by giving them uh, government backed loans uh, so they can go to a bank and borrow uh, and they don't have to pay interest for a year, um, quite a significant amount. Um, when a company is entering these difficult periods, do you find that you have to tutor them through the government loans that, uh, sorry, the government support that's available in order to get them to a position where they actually might be able to pay you back? Is, is that a conversation that you end up having? Yeah, yeah, basically that's it. Um, uh, since uh, all our, I, I mean, overwhelming majority of our borrowers are coming from uh, Latvia, uh, so basically, uh, we, we know the Latvian legislation, obviously, uh, and uh, we know uh, approximately what are the what, what are the possible kind of possibilities to uh, in the context of support of those businesses. And then we try to negotiate, including um, any 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 our kind of a contacts or whatever with those who are in the uh, government financial institutions, for instance. Uh, uh, Altum we have, uh, so uh, that's to find a way how to uh, how to escape from that kind of drastic situation of uh, default and so on. So basically, answering your question regarding uh, that, why we uh, uh, so if we if we have a a decent collateral under those loans, uh, why don't we uh, go to court uh, that easy? Uh, what we do. Uh, is that um, that we understand that um, uh, the kind of a court procedure uh, it takes uh, the legal enforcement kind of a process it takes a lot of time and uh, it it costs money. Uh, we have a uh, provision fund uh, which uh, still hasn't been uh, uh, paid out to 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 clients since. We have now registered any capital loss for any project. Uh, I think we will change it, change it uh, in the nearest future. Uh, but still, mm, we need to think very carefully who will pay for the for the uh, legal um, enforcement procedures. Since um, uh, yeah, um, that's an interesting point because um, uh, the cost of recovery. Um, can you not? Um, presumably you're including that in your loan contracts to the borrower that they're responsible for cost of recovery as well uh, is do you know if that provision is there and you know is if if so from your experience actually have you been able to get the cost of recovery back from uh, a borrower so basically as, as i mentioned uh, uh, till now we don't have any any capital loss we don't have any cases uh, that have okay. gone through all the process of uh, the okay. legal. However, this topic is very, very relevant to us now. Um, as I mentioned during my uh, morning session, um, I mentioned the, the the lifespan, so to say, of a crowdfunding platform. Uh, um, and uh, at the beginning of a platform's life, uh, you know, as in life, uh, you feel very romantic about uh, the projects that. Uh, that that you publish on the platform, and that's why, uh, and that's why you don't uh, always uh, think uh, properly regarding uh, those kind of um, um, consequences in 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 a case of uh, a default of that project. So basically, uh, we have a, we have earned a, our fee, uh, obviously, uh, for those projects that we've published, um, but. Uh, and also, we, we've we've been talking about this provision fund, uh, in which we we we, we take one or two percent uh, out of the um, funded amount, uh, which should cover uh, the the legal expenses in in, in case of, of something, and also to pay uh, pay out to our investors. Uh, but this is one of the top the usage of provision fund, which uh, will be also raised uh, during my webinar. I don't want to dig very much deep into into it uh, but it, it is very interesting topic um, I mean covering the uh, recovery 
procedures face covering expenses of recovery, uh, cost of recovery. Uh, if I may, I mean, actually, this is a very, um, very deep topic. Uh, I mean, outside from uh, the setup of uh, whatever structure CrowdStore, for example, uses, I think this is a um, very um, good agency situation that Ali, you rose up. I mean, who pays for legal expenses? The uh, and the, how is this payment happening? And uh, and uh, who uh, works on collection? And that's something that I think some of the um, sort of platforms maybe haven't sold out fully uh, when they started uh, operating. How is that setup actually going to work out? Now, you know, uh, from um, plat for, for any lender's point of view, um, you always evaluate if, if I, for example, the, the process that costs is this hard collection when you go through the courts. And, um, and uh, irrespective of you have provisions in your loan contracts that uh, I mean, typically you have provisions that all these costs of collection go towards the, you know, uh, towards the um, debtor. But the problem is that if the debtor already owes you, you have to invest to get something back. And the there could be situations, especially if these loans are like some business loans can be and uh, based basically only on cash flow provision and the company uh, on cash flow without any security and maybe just personal warranty, which sometimes also is not very strong. So you might end up in situations where even you might consider if I would invest additional money in going through court, would you get it back? And then this sort of even that investment is at risk. And that's a problem, for example, what's, what I talk about, mentioned about this agency situation. If, for example, platform as such is sort of uh, under contract that they will be performing this collection and they see this collection change is very small, what do they do? Do they invest their own money and uh, and uh, go for it, um, or they don't? And that's this sort of raises a potential conflict of interest. And uh, this is something that um, um, maybe hasn't actually been too much discussed about this uh, these kind of nuances. Yeah, especially in the context of uh, the kind of a, uh, the fact that the platform is a middleman. So basically. Uh, it, it, yes, it connected the investor to the to the borrower, but then uh, in case of any problems, I mean, it, it is platform's uh, task uh, to assess the risks, and that's why investors experience uh, these kind of a higher than average uh, returns because of the, those risks. Uh, but in case of default, um, uh, yes, exactly. But basically, who need to pay? Uh, you know, it's it's you know it's as easily could have been Mintos here joining in and then uh, having the same sort of a uh, problem. You know, because um, although the platform can be just uh, just a broker and can be just a middleman, it's unreasonable, I think, to expect that each individual, especially retail investors, will pull together and know how to do and actually process this collection. So, in in a sense, that's. Um, <laughs> I mean, other guys probably have something to contribute the, as well, but uh, that, that's a very uh, interesting point because the role of an introducer, and you know, there are other names for introducers such as brokers, and brokers exist in all areas of our lives. You know, real estate brokers when you're buying a home, um, if, when you're buying savings products, uh, you know, independent financial advisors. Um, you know, historically, I don't think um, introducers slash brokers have been uh, held to a high enough standard <clears throat> and um, now that we have these electronic platforms that we're building um, and, and everyone on, on this call um, has in one way or another um, in addition to uh, giving customers just a nice interface to interact with and you know a, an app on their phone and just to make things easier um, there should be significant business investment uh, into ensuring that proper risk assessment is done and proper risk is communicated to customers where they're able to make um, appropriate choices. Martinez and I uh, touched on this topic in um, our earlier call on, you know, what what does grade A risk mean on one platform uh, may be equal to grade A, uh, grade C risk on another platform. Uh, but the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that as a, in, an introducing platform or a broker, um, those platforms should work to operate 
a high standard when it comes to risk assessment. It should be part of uh, the service. Um, and if you're doing good uh, risk assessment, you're taking the right security, you're solving a lot of the potential problems earlier on uh, that you don't have to experience at a later stage when you're when you're trying to recover. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but even uh, the Mark, best, I think uh, the bestest of the best, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> this uh, risk assessments, it, it seems implied in the contract of platform, right, that they do the risk assessment. But even the best risk assessment will not avoid that there will be defaults. So as much as there is a good um, good risk assessment as a function of the platform should be performing, I think there should be very clear and good way how they also commit to uh, doing the collection side. That, that, that's right, and also uh, uh, during I think the... that we we went a bit off the rails with, with the agenda. <laughs> right? uh, you should cut us off here. <laughs> no, I think that's fine. So that's a natural discussion. So um, okay, okay. so I, I let it go for some time. Uh, but yeah, you can uh, you can also speak some words, of course. Uh, guys, I think that it is important to understand that debt collection begins before you give out the loan uh, and this is this what lending business is about before you give out the money you need to have the procedures in place you need to understand what you will do with this particular asset in case something goes not as planned so uh, i think that's uh, what yuris uh, was saying at the beginning that they had uh, enough of enough of bad stories it's it's the way you learn these things you know in, in different business situations you need to have different uh different procedures to 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 move forward so for example what we do we usually, we only work with real estate uh development loans and only with first rank mortgage we do that with the very particular reason that many scenarios that we have uh, considered if you don't have the first rank mortgage, which is uh, registered in, uh, with a notary, and so it's in the state registers, there are plenty of scenarios how you can end up with a fraud. So it is one thing, you know, when you operate with a 25,000 euros loan, which is significantly big for a business or for a person, but it's not significantly big that you would chase it through the courts and, and all the long procedures. Uh, so if you go into larger loans, so for example, what we do we, when it's 300,000, 500,000, 2 million, 3 million euros, the only way you can work is through, uh, real estate collaterals that provide you a strong leverage in whatever happens. So it's one thing that you need to prepare yourself. And then the other thing is, I think that what you just said is, is very correct that you need to have in place uh, monitoring procedures that would allow you foresee if something goes uh, not according to the plan so that you could start doing some soft recovery before you even have late payments. So, and, and the hard recovery is the final step, which is, which is, I think is, is never an option. I would uh, disagree with Anatoly's uh, policy of no mercy because in the end, lending business is not uh, debt recovery business. And this is a very important thing. So for example, when we are thinking of real estate development loans with real estate collateral, it's never a question, well, collateral must be sufficient to cover the loan in, in case it goes default, but it's never the question if we want to use the collateral. And in any case, no, I hope that I will never have to exercise the, the right. But the collateral is a, uh, in my case, is a safety net or a leverage that I can uh, exercise to steer the loan loan life uh, in in some manner which is comfortable to my investors. All right, to give them more security, right? Uh, to give them the more security, but I think that the most important thing is to get your money back. Uh, it's always like this. You, first, you you need to set up rights securities to to have leverage in case you need it, and then after you go out, the first the most important thing is to get the money back. So it's I don't think it's about it's about 
making a, a, a standoff about how, how strong you are. Maybe in some cases, uh, it might be that your, your job will be to find uh, who will refinance your creditor. And, mm -hmm. and I think in many cases, it, that's exactly what happens. I think exactly when they when they like exactly like you say. I mean, as soon as uh, you see that there are signs, and actually maybe even client doesn't go in default, it is I think a function of a lender to be uh, become basically a kind of like consultant, and that's uh, your role, which changes. You know, you're not just monitoring; you're trying to help the guys out. Correct. So let's now and then from what we discussed for the you know what what the topics for for this uh panel discussion so one thing is for example when we see that something is not according to the plan so the, when the monitoring procedures trigger some uh yellow flag what you start doing you start doing preparation you start playing chess so it's not that you gave out the loan and now you are going to do uh, some other fundraising for another project. No, you, you keep on monitoring it and thinking what should be done in case something happens. So they, for example, if they have not enough sales, so what what what's what procedure should should follow next? If their construction works are not following the schedule, what you should do then? So it always it is a bit strategic. And the, the smaller the loan, the more difficult it is to apply the attention needed for it. So this is where, you know, I'm coming back again. This is why we chose to work with anything above 300,000 euros, because below that you can't pay enough specialized attention and day-to-day and -day monitoring. So, so Martinez, what is, what, are, what is the period of time uh, I know uh, you have said that you have not experienced any kind of uh, courts in this strict kind of enforcement, legal enforcement. Uh, uh, but still, what is your feeling of uh, uh, how how do your investors feel about this period uh, when they are satisfied uh, with uh, without going to court, but uh, to negotiate? What is how long is that period? You think? Well, this is this is the the thing that when I say that we don't have defaults, I don't I mean we don't have late loans, so our investors don't have this uh, concern whether we will how long we should wait. Uh, how there many is no case where where we're waiting. How many projects we, we have? have uh, we have a little bit over uh, over ten, and the and the loan portfolio is about six million euros right now. So now it's seven. So, but I think that uh, important thing is. Uh, so, sorry, how could, could I ask also? Yeah. Uh, two two more questions regarding those uh, your your portfolio. I mean, uh, what is the repayment schedule? Uh, are those installment payments kind of each month, or it is a bullish payment at the end of the loan period? We have monthly monthly payments uh, for the interest, uh, quarterly payments for the interest, sorry, and uh, bullet loan at the end. And it comes from the fact that we do development financing, so it's just the the nature of the business that you have the cash mm -hmm. flows at the end. Um, mm -hmm. What I wanted to come back on was uh, you mentioned that uh, Anatolius mentioned that you know they they for example have this voting system for their investors. Then this is perhaps an, an interesting topic uh, for crowdfunding industry in general is about whether it should be the crowd who decides or the operator who is operating on their behalf. Because in many cases, operator will have more knowledge than the investors as well as more experience. So he can actually make a more well-informed decisions. But, but uh, however, I, it brings exactly. the risk that, you know, you can get complaints. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, Martinez. You, you get my point. So basically, my, my point is that we need to give out as much our kind of experienced analysis information to our investors. And we to my opinion we cannot decide since it is not our money and we always will not satisfy our decision will not satisfy all the investors kind of opinion and then we we give out the and everything we, we we've got 
and then they decide. I, I, I don't know. I, I see it this way. What? What? I don't know. What others think about it? Um, I think um, when customers come to your platform, they're outsourcing uh, expertise, uh, and I, I think you'll you'll get into, you know. At what if you go down the voting route? At what percentage do you cut off? Is it uh, a simple majority? At fifty-one percent, the decision is made. Um, are different types of decisions? Do they have different thresholds? Is you know a more serious decision at seventy-five percent? Um, either way, I think you will get customer complaints. If you get if you go for a um, a majority, fifty-one percent, you got forty-nine percent of people that you know thought differently. And they're going to express their concerns to the platform. Um, I think, um, as uh, one of you gentlemen said moments ago, the platform is more informed, have professionals with many years experience, and will make an informed decision in the best interests of the investors. As long as it's understood that you're acting in the best interest of investors, and that there is no other ulterior motive or agenda or commercial benefit to the platform to act a certain way i think at that point you should avoid um confrontation with the customers unnecessary confrontation also if you're very clear about how you're going to handle these difficult scenarios up front i.e before investors invest it's very clear on your website what your process is how you um, uh, you know be as transparent as possible about how those decisions are made. Again, I think you'll head off a lot of customer complaints. It'll always be difficult to please everybody. Um, someone someone has to take the lead, and that person who takes the lead will always be open to criticism. Um, I think it's the platform's responsibility, really. Is is my um, uh, is my uh, thought. Um, naturally that might seem a little bit less democratic um, and in a crowdfunding world when you're looking to empower retail investors and other investors uh, um, it might seem uh, uh, that that approach might seem a, a bit of opposition to the nature of crowdfunding um, uh, but um, I, I really think it's the best way forward I agree Ali I agree. I mean, the, that's um, from from our experience, and also when we started doing this uh, crowdfunding angle as well, and uh, as a way to fund deals, we set up it this way that we ask for a pretty broad mandate, also in terms of collection, and in in um, um, with the expectation that um, because of well, our setup allows for or ensures that we also have skin in the game. We are the active partners in this uh, investment and we take initiative and uh, are responsible for implementing our procedures and uh, communicating sort of reporting in a sense to what are our steps uh, regularly to the uh, everybody involved so that they can follow the, the activity and at the same time they have been for example also in, in our case a precedent where we have asked for a general vote um, actually there was a there can be a situation that in collection there you know has to be some critical decision to move one way or another and uh, it's it's uh, we in that sense we basically approached everybody individual and that's I think it's a benefit of not having a big retail base of investors but we still approached everybody individually and asked uh, about the uh, their opinion however at the same time providing all the information and giving our view what what we would do what we think is one. I think it's, it's otherwise, it's pretty pretty impossible for retail investor who has especially, you know, laid out in a diversified portfolio, 100 euros per each case, then go into this case, understand it, and make an informed decision. It's, it's I think it's uh, impractical actually instead. Uh, time value for money counted, for example. No, I think also, also uh, I'm also invested um, on Crowdestor and, but I, but I don't get every project. And if I have so much uh, loans in my portfolio, uh, getting this mail from Crowdestor, hey, um, 
do you want to vote this or this? I have to get into this project and just understand so what's going on. And just for a loan um, where I invested 50 or 100, 100 euro, that's uh, also for me really unpractical, um, unless I like this feature because it's pretty new, but um, from, from, from the decision side, it's, it's quite hard for me. Thank you for your honest uh, kind of opinion. <laughs> no problem. I think from the customer uh, side, it's a very attractive um, process. You know, if I was a customer, yeah, I'd love to be involved in the decision making process. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're on the other side, I just think it's harder for the platform and just less practical. Uh, Martinez, sorry, you're about to say something. I, I, I wanted, wanted to, to say that uh, uh, re re regarding this voting, also, um, uh, interesting topic since uh, I, I do not agree with you guys, sorry. Uh, so the first the first thing is that, uh, of course, Ali, you mentioned the, met, uh, the, the trust that investor puts uh, on the platform kind of expertise. Um, I, I, I do not disagree with, the, uh, with you in, in this, in this uh, context. Of course, it is a matter of trust. And also the information that we provide to investors in order they get this uh, kind of a get to the informative decision, informed decision. Um, uh, this information is also not checked. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, we, we will not provide any confidential information that we have been provided by the borrower to investors, individual. Um, the second, so this is a matter of trust, but also we, uh, we, we it is not our money my my uh, kind of a view on this one uh, this is not our money it is uh, yours money for instance so large uh, as investors with us thank you for investing with us uh, and you should decide and it, it is not kind of a also crowdfunding is not a um, I, I am not a kind of a considering it as a very very much passive so this is passive versus active investments I mean um, if you invest in index of course uh, you are very, very much passive investor. You don't care what uh, is happening. You, you get your 10%, for instance, um, a year, and that's it. But here is a bit, uh, is a bit different uh, peculiar, peculiarities uh, of this uh, type of investment. For funding, you know, we see that our investors are very much involved in the process, and they, they, they do like uh, to, be, to be informed as much as the platform uh, is informed. Uh, they want uh, this power of decision making. Um, so basically, uh, we are happy to provide this this power to them. And also, uh, in case of this conflict of interest, and kind of a, you, you will not always uh, uh, satisfy uh, the hundred percent of investors of any project. Obviously, you will not satisfy, as our experience uh, shows, you will not satisfy uh, when you don't give power to investors. Uh, to decide you will also not satisfy uh, when you don't give it so when you uh, decide by your own and that's why what we see now that uh, in our vo vo voting a kind of a project we don't we don't have uh, the proportion of 51 versus 49 uh, we, we have 80 we have 95 versus 5 and um, um, in, in in many cases we publish the voting uh, as such that uh, with, with this kind of a definition that okay there here is all the information we've got here is what we have checked here is what our analysis it, it is not kind of a 20 page long report when you okay you have invested 100 euros and you need to dig deep and you know to to have this all kind of a um, week long analysis on your own no 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 it is very smart and concise kind of a one page long analysis and you can make a decision very quick, and then and then you make a de decision by yourself. So, so when you say eighty or ninety-five percent, are you saying that just on your experience, eighty or ninety percent of the investors seem to agree, or are you saying that you set a threshold at eighty or ninety percent? Uh, I'm no, not threshold, not threshold. Threshold usually okay. is fifty percent plus one plus right. one vote. So uh, okay, mentally. fine. 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 Which, which is very kind of a, you know, uh, very well established in our terms and conditions and so on. Sure. Basically, that, that's completely kind of a transparent. Okay. I mean, yeah. You know, I think it's uh, what uh, Crowdester has is, is this uh, 
textbook uh, crowdfunding platform where people invest in their local businesses and have their own say whether the cafe across the street should go into hard recovery or should you give them another month to sell coffee you know and try to to, to pay off the loan and uh, it really you know when you look at it in in the, in the concept i really love it i mean it it sounds like how crowdfunding should be it's it's like kickstarter right so there's a personal uh, connection yeah you, you really yeah. Have, and, I, and i look at and, and I, when i look at what crowdfunder does i mean it looks like a lot of businesses are really smaller and they have these very uh, crowd appealing businesses like computer games, small, small, medium enterprise. I mean, it's, it's really cool. And I even have a friend who said that he invests in crowd, crowd uh, because it's cool. That was his argument because it, it's really, he really feels involved in business. Uh, and I think it's, you know, one way how it, how it could, could go. And then, and, and in that case, people, maybe they, they should have the, the right to, to vote. And it's, you know, it's one, one way how you could deal with, do the business. Uh, and then, you know, maybe we have this, this other, other scenario where, for example, I operate a 2.5 million euro loan on a real estate development project. And I see that maybe some yellow flags are lighting up and, and you're less interested in, in case, the, you're less interested in the coffee that the developer makes for you when you go to see him. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, <laughs> But you know, but in my case, because the the one thing the amount is is considerably larger, so there is less uh, less willingness to 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 play th this uh, socially responsible lender uh, position or a friendly lender position. But it also, you know, perhaps it, it, in this case it clicks on that, you know, this is your job to, to make sure that this huge loan would work out well. Now it's no longer individual vote of the people because they might not understand what are the opportunities to refinance, what might be the additional clauses that you would like to add to your contract along the way, uh, what should be interim solutions or some interim agreements with the developer so that it could could go further and perhaps you know it could go even even you know as far as uh what also anatoly mentioned sometimes there is confidential information disclosing of which would default the company so you actually need to be uh very sensitive um, sensitive yeah with information that you're dealing with and professional large businesses large clients would expect that from you that you are even in hard times that you are very professional with how you deal with information absolutely yeah so, yeah. i agree basically it's very dependent on the specifics of the platform and specifics of the business uh, uh where you where, where you in and uh, definitely so it's also all about uh, educate the investors in the end, right? No, I don't know. I, it, it's it's very hard for me to swallow this whole uh, concept. I'm just thinking. I mean, uh, um, <laughs> retail investors, and I mean, they are uh, we somehow overlooking fact that they are smart enough to understand which business, uh, for example, to fund or not. No, let's say they have the skill. Although it's basically in my believe it still requires some you know professional education and understanding of financial analysis and risks and other old things i mean if we can swallow that i mean i, I really don't take this that per retail investors should be capable of making collection decisions this simply is it's it's a professional job that is uh, it's highly specialized it's based on whatever you experience you have gathered it's it's so so niche uh, Niche. They can be just gut calls, and that's the only thing you can ask them in a, in a voting. It's should we, you know, be very aggressive with them or gentle, and that, that that's the only thing. I mean, same way like you you would buy a bond uh, in in let's say Mogo, uh, and um, for example, uh, in some case it's uh, defaults, and you wouldn't be really expected that you are going and then you know collecting from them. It's there is a setup on that instrument how a protection of a bond securities work and what happens in case of default. And I don't think it should be different from uh, from uh, from um, 
platform it basically means that this retail investor is very exposed very unprotected i mean they went in on project because they thought it fun and they end up voting uh, should i be taking off their uh, cash register or uh, you know uh, uh, suing them for personal warranty and uh, dislocating from a house where they live i don't know i mean how do you make these calls basically the voting is not uh, very much uh, in the specifics of the debt collection process obviously uh, we have uh, we will have uh, published uh, a, a very very nice and kind of a transparent debt collection how we do the the, the soft uh, debt collection and also uh, there will be a kind of a uh, um, according to the legislation uh, the then the hard the this not hard but the strict legal enforcement procedure. Oh, but honestly, so they, it's, it's not really nothing against you know, especially crowded or Don't take it like every every question is, oh, no. is, is aimed there. Oh, so so it, it just in general, I think it's it's a important thing, you know, that uh, um, I mean, should we should this industry move into the area where every retail investor is highly educated, both in financial matters to understand where to invest and not, and in legal matters to understand where to and how to collect or not, or not, uh, or the platform takes this responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, so sorry. one of the things that that you 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 sent in the outline for the guidelines about the the panel. One one thing you mentioned was about transparency. And, Correctly, uh, I think that you know, for example, it, it's it's it's. Uh, I would like to add to what you just said, uh, and to mention transparency here. So, uh, one of the core values of our platform from the beginning was to uh, to provide investors with as much information as possible. So if property valuation don't match with the buy price, then we should say it. And if uh, the owner has some legal uh, battles in his other company, we should say it. So we should be as transparent as possible. So with every project that we have, we prepare this information document, which is usually, you know, 15 to 25 PowerPoint slides that are heavy with texts, graphs, and whatever. Uh, this is how I imagine transparency, right? Then what happens is I have a conversation with either a small investor or some of the high net worth individuals who invest with us. And their question is, Martina, so is it a good loan or is it a bad loan? And I say, well, take a look at the prospectus yeah you know i'm certain that you're doing a good job and he transfers you know whatever fifty thousand euros uh th this is you know what i mean by saying transparency even though we disclose a lot of information many investors don't read it through and they trust a lot uh the platform and it's it's competence it's professionality to to deal with with hard things and you know to go and even a step further from this uh we deal with real estate and among our investors we have some real estate developers themselves or, or people who are involved in real estate as valuators as lawyers whatever you know it's really funny when you talk with them and you find out how little they understand about real estate lending because they might be super specialized and, and very high quality professionals in some particular real estate sector or activity. But when it comes to lending, they lack some general understanding, even general understanding about how mortgages work, how legal procedures would work, uh, what other um, leverages you can put into the contract and how to use them. So when I have professionals who have all the information and they still lack uh, uh, competence to make decision, that brings me to the fact that, you know, it's, it's only platform who can run the business. It's, and uh, it's because, you know, you, you saw, well, I operate this for three years. You just do this for 17 years or 13. I mean, it's, it's double digit. So much experience, no one, one, no one can have it. <laughs> there are very few people who are as experienced as him. So sometimes I think that you just will have a gut feeling. You know, we should go hard on these. And we should write to Facebook friends of this one. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I hope we never have to do that. <laughs> it's interesting. Also, that, say, uh, uh, Yuri, Anatoly, you, you're gonna. You mentioned at the very beginning that uh, you, you had uh, a lot of experience with with recoveries. Maybe you have some, you know, non-standard solutions that you had used to share. You know, to 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 show the length how far you go to to get things rolling. Non-standard solutions. Um. Well, let me think about this for a little bit. Yeah, uh, well, yeah because I wanted to just also to comment about this kind of a should should anything that happens uh, in in the context of that collection, for instance, um, uh, should it happen uh, in individual kind of a way, uh, depending on the uh, uh, feeling of uh, any manager of the company or the company itself. Um, where should it be standardized in all cases in order to be kind of a, in order to, uh, to, 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 to calm the investors? I mean, when, only when you understand that in each and every case uh, the company goes uh, in a standard way, not looking at an individual kind of a, uh, no, kind of a specifics, uh, is it better than than uh, is it better to have individual kind of a decisions uh, rather than standardized decisions? What do you think about this? Well, because, I, I know, I know, it, for sure, it's, it's definitely has to be standardized. Um, I, I have no no doubts maybe, about. Maybe it. I can. Yeah, sure. Maybe I, I, I can answer it a bit different. You know, it goes. If you if you're doing consumer lending and you're giving out you know 500 euro loans to buy a new iPhone or a thousand euro loans, then you have a standardized procedure. If you're giving out 20,000, 50,000, 500,000, 2 million, 3 million euros, you must have procedures that you follow. But the size of the deal requires you to be flexible and creative. But, but but the end user, the end investor may may still uh, kind of invest only hundred euros in in both cases. I mean, in the large project, hundred euros or thousand euros and thousand euros in case of a and when this, the end. And and you know, and this is and this is I think one of the fundamental problems for crowdfunding industry that uh, the investor invests a small amount, and therefore he doesn't really care that much because that amount is relatively small for him and and he's not going after recovery this is why the platform should really care for the people who are investing through it because the platform operates the entire amount right so it's two million euros or sixty thousand euros well this one is really worth to work on it doesn't matter if it comes from one person or 700 people i mean it's it's matter of well, it's it's obligation of the platform actually to to look after it right i mean just to build up on what martina's saying i mean i think the overall there should be a very strict framework on what your collection process is like and then um the uh this framework should provide for um situations where they are like uh, small standardized deals and larger flexible deals and in the Typically, you understand which way to go, but there should be over, overarching sort of principles, what you do, how you react to late days, how what kind of decisions you make internally, and what triggers these decisions when you send warning letters, when you go to court, what matters, co what means cooperation, and most importantly, how many times you restructure, what you do about the restructuring of the loan. So um, overall, there should be, I mean, this this framework, it's, it's, it's really something that you basically redevelop and build on uh, every default case. But uh, just to, I mean, the, about previous question that Mark Martinez said about, uh, you know, some wor your loan workout situations. Now, for example, now we are dealing with one company that is in, uh, in trouble, actually uh, one of the rare ones in our portfolio from this uh, pandemic situation. And uh, um, basically, um, in that case, what we did is actually what we continue doing. We are uh, helping them. It's, it's a manufacturing company that's stuck on uh, more inventories than they needed, and uh, we just connect them with sort of other clients in our uh, in our sort of historical pool who could buy this inventory. And uh, we did a few deals, and that actually uh, helped to basically almost clear our loan out. So I, I know it's it's a bit goes back to this role that when you are when you're doing a workout, when you're working with a client that is late, uh, you have to seek on how you 
help them out and, and because it's become basically your problem as well, right? Um, it, it's interesting um, that you say that. Um, you know, I, I think to summarize what both you and Martinez have said is a framework is necessary, um, but a degree of flexibility in that framework is also necessary, considering that every situation might be slightly different. I'd like to add to that and say that framework is also necessary to demonstrate to the borrower that there is an ultimate penalty, that this isn't just free money. And um, it, it, it's, not a situ it's not like lending money to a family member if they can't pay it back, you know, no big deal. Um, th this is people's savings, and um, uh, which has resulted from hard work um, uh, maybe stress, maybe putting yourself under pressure, and that that needs that those funds need to be protected. At the same time, not coming at a borrower with too hard just hard a sledgehammer, because we we all know ourselves how difficult it, difficult it is to build a business and all the responsibilities that you've that you've got within it. Sometimes you just need a little bit of breathing space uh, in order to get back on get back on your feet. So framework, I think to summarize, it's, it's, it's necessary to have that framework in place so that there's a clear process, flexibility, but also to identify the ultimate penalty to a borrower that, that, that you know, uh, we're not just going to give out money for free and, and, and not worry about getting it back. All right. Well said. Okay, guys, uh, let's, let's move on a little bit. Um, just, just to wrap it up a little bit from my side. Um, so for me, it both is important as an investor so that you offer all necessary information for me as an investor. And on the other side, that you do the best you can in your business that I can trust you um, for my money, even if it's just uh, 50 or 100 euros. But um, yeah, in the end, it's important that I get some, some, some return of it. So, but let's come just now to the to another point um to the investor side the question is when will you inform investors about the problems if you have some in, in your project i mean i saw it in crowdessa's case for example that every time when you announce something bad about a project investors in telegram for example are freaking out and calling for your time and also have a lot of questions even if the, the loan is, is one day late so when is the best time to inform the investors about that something is going on in the project and that maybe a default is coming up. Yeah, but first of all, I, I would say that uh, uh, the, the company, the platform should have one, uh, in ideal case, one uh, kind of official channel of communicating the, the updates uh, uh, regarding the projects. It is uh, unacceptable to my opinion to differentiate between, uh, between investors, between channels, so we, kind of uh, those those investors who sit more in, in Telegram uh, channel uh, should not, not get uh, more information than those who don't sit in uh, Telegram channel. So basically, the platform should have one channel. Uh, we, we, are, uh, we are working on it, uh, so we don't uh, publish uh, updates uh, anymore in Telegram. Um, and so we do publish in these kind of a uh, specific kind of a section of the investors cabinet which is the update section um, uh, regarding the the timing of the update uh, this is another topic that I will cover uh, next week uh, this uh, is uh, called in the agenda that we have published uh, perhaps you saw it Lars uh, so this is a communication standard uh, we see since we operate um, in in different business segments, as I mentioned, with different collaterals and so on. We we know that, for instance, uh, Dystopia, that famous game with McGregor as ambassador, um, it, as a specialized project, we have funded four million uh, euro. It is a big project. A lot of our investors are exposed to this project. So basically, uh, we understand that we need to put uh, much more emphasis. On kind of a and and, and to put um, often uh, the updates regarding the project since the exposure is so big, uh, and also uh, we have SME projects. For instance, uh, I don't know the Yakuza restaurant. Um, so basically, ten ten thousand euros. 
uh, we we need to we need to have a, a clear uh, framework, as Ali and Yuvis mentioned, um, of that collection. And if, if anything happens, uh, kind of uh, uh, unexpectedly, uh, then we should just kind of uh, communicate in a standard way uh, what we have received from the borrower, what information, and uh, to make to make sure that investors know what we know, and in a in a kind of in a in a frequency uh, that is also standard. I mean, and of course, uh, uh, it, it is, for instance, uh, for us, okay, I, I can say that we will publish, for instance, for SME projects, uh, each 30 days, uh, we will ensure that each 30 days, uh, now we have an update uh, for the project, uh, in case anything interesting, anything unexpected, I mean, uh, happens with the borrower and we receive such information that I don't know, uh, for instance, insurance uh, case, uh, we, 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 we put it instantly, of course, we will not wait for 30 days uh, in case we, we know it on the fifth day. So basically the investor relations department uh, dealing with this and uh, we, we understand the importance of it and we are working on it. <laughs> okay, Martinez, how is it uh, for you if you have, you're facing some problems, even if you have no problems right now, but um, what's, what is the way um, uh, you would inform the investors. Yeah. Uh, the information to investors goes and do scenarios or well, first notice and then follow ups if needed. Uh, the first one is if loan is late. So then naturally we would issue an, an, an information that loan is late and we are negotiating with the, de with the developer when he could start repaying the interest uh, or and then you know if 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 after being late on interest he is late with further payments or you have 30 plus days of delay then you go into your regular procedure standard procedures uh, and in other another case is if you would start any legal actions so however if you have any i don't know you could say it if you have any concerns or if you are playing the chess, you know, and, and issuing some new uh, uh, or having communication with the developer, some you're into researching something or trying to, to, to get yourself protected some, some, from some certain other risks, then we would not uh, inform investors about that because one thing it is, it is a, let, let's put it, work in pro in process you could call it like this so it's an information that might cause a stress for a person who's not a, uh, not experienced and uh, is not aware of the of, of the of the business procedures uh and yet you know it, it doesn't mean that you will take any actions just because you do research or you find something that you would like to dig on so yeah, I think that the general like short answer is if loan is late or if you take any legal actions, then you go into informing people. Okay, thank you. Yours? Right. I mean, I uh, yeah, absolutely agree about this. Um, um, clear communication channels is is uh, very important. I think. Um, clear and single i think uh, as soon as um, as soon as loan becomes late uh, it's um, it's uh, important that platform does proactive informing rather than reactive right that's that's uh, not a cycle you want to be that you respond to requests but rather you are giving the information out and clearly from you know uh, a, a date when loan is late one day uh, spotlight is on the platform so they they may start asking questions so what we developed we we have a uh, uh, a weekly uh, weekly update every, for example, for us it's every Monday. If a loan is late, uh, investors know they should be going in the sort of logging in and seeing what's uh, what's the latest situation. And um, um, there could be also updates in case there is something that pops up through uh, monitoring. Um, um, but generally, it's uh, this, of this regularity is required in in, in the case of uh, of a late loan situation. Yuri, sorry, what, what happens when there is no new information? I mean, weekly is very often. Uh, I mean, um, 
you're right. I mean, it's it for for example for a long collection that goes into a um, default, there is nothing to do on a weekly basis. Then you just give news when there are news. Um, there is a stage when uh, somebody is late and you uh, then uh, just a few days and you communicate. There probably some exchange of promises and and follow up there. But uh, I agree. I mean, it's not always the uh, that you post on every case once a week. This typically holds for for cases that are late but not late more you know so late that you start collection or some sort of um, uh, serious workout procedure there but i think sometimes it's also important to say okay there is no new information please wait for the next update so sometimes no information is also a good information could be um you're right yeah yeah, yeah. Well. ali what about you um, okay um just to recap because i got slightly distracted the, the questions in relation to um when to inform investors is that is that right yes when you will inform this uh, the first time yeah, I, I i think there is a uh balance i made martinez laugh um i i think there's a a, a balance here um uh, uh the balance being i think providing information too early um uh, and making your investors nerv unnecessarily nervous when there actually isn't a problem is not the right thing to do. Um, so I, I think you've got to be very clear on, um, uh, you know, what scenarios really require, you know, in that process, in that life cycle of um, a, a bad debt from the early stage to uh, the latter stages when one should communicate uh, and I think it's it, it it's different for every platform or different for every product um, so I think what's actually most important is that you're clear what your procedures are early on as long as you state what those procedures are mm. uh, and you're clear on in your communications then I don't think you'll have a problem with investors if you say you're going to do something and you don't do it then that becomes a problem uh, if your policy is we're going to tell you everything, then make sure you tell them everything. If your policy is we're just going to tell you the serious stuff, then make sure you do that. Um, and and I'm I'm uh, you know I don't like to unnecessarily worry people. I'd probably be in the camp of just tell people what they need to know. Otherwise, you're just going to be on the phone with people all day, rather than speaking to your investor. You're not speaking to the borrower and helping them through the situation. You know, we've all only got a certain amount of time and resources. Uh, the investors invested through you. Your time should be making sure that the uh, loan performs as opposed to explaining yourself multiple times to uh, investors saying is absolutely the same thing. And, uh, you know, we touched on this earlier. Everybody now, uh, historically, banking wasn't transparent. In the last 10 or 15 years, um, because of various bad events uh, and the development of technology and changing cultural attitudes, we're a lot clearer um, with each other, or at least we try to be. So transparency is a basic expectation, but how many people read? <laughs> you know, I open my inbox every day and I'm just bombarded with so much information. I'm unsubscribing, putting into spam. I'm still bombarded with loads of information. You know, what do I read? Um, so, you, you know, knowing what to look for and not communicating with people unnecessarily, I think is is key. Um, that's my uh, that's my input into that particular point. Yeah. At least you should read the voting uh, information from Cordesto if you are invested there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, there, there is a situation where platforms have, um, for example, zero losses for years, and, but it also means that they have zero experience with handling with DFORS. So in your opinion, how can companies gain experience in handling losses um, yeah, without any losses? Uh, uh, I rock to my garden, right? <laughs> I, I, per, personally, I think a lot of people get involved in setting up these new platforms without having a zero uh, experience. You know, mm -hmm. I before I set up my business, I had 12 years uh, banking experience from 
operations to risk management to trading to sales um and still i encountered things that um uh i hadn't quite experienced before um i would be very wary um of jumping on a platform where the founders uh, uh jumping on a platform that's involved in financial services with people that lack experience in financial services um you know there is i've come across some really fantastic websites uh, and the, the leaders of the business tend to be great at marketing, PR, graphics, uh, uh, and presenting themselves, but just don't understand financial products very well. Um, you know, those sorts of businesses, I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't get involved in. Um, the, there's a saying in London um, that um, might make people laugh. Uh, it's all fur and no knickers which means you're wearing a fur coat, but underneath you're completely naked. Um, so there's no substance to what's going on. It's all show. Um, and uh, that's what I'd be wary of. You know, sometimes the most, on, on the surface, what the, the most uninteresting um, offer actually has the best controls and compliance in place. And that's really what I try and understand as an investor. Do these guys know what they're doing? Are they operating in a compliant fashion? Do they have appropriate controls in place? I read something on the news. I think it was a German company. Oh, Dolphin. Has anybody come across a company called Dolphin? Look it up. Yeah. They were paying their brokers 20 to 30% of the funds that were being raised from investors. Wow. Well. And then they were promising those investors 10% returns. I'm sure that so, ended well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, what? Uh, let's do the maths. 20 or 30% to brokers, 10% to the investor. And I think they were involved in real estate development loans. So what, and obviously the company has got its own uh, costs involved. So you're looking minimum the the investment has to turn return 50% to break even. Well, where is this going to end up? It's going to end up in a massive default. Look it up. If I can find the news article, I'll send it to you guys. It's just amazing. In fact, I've got it here somewhere. Um, look at who's running the business. If it's all about marketing and making things look good, run away. But th this is not a good example, I think, of a smart marketing also. Uh, sorry, what in particular? That, um, what's, I, what's I, mean, if, I mean, if you promise to invest as 50, kind of a 50%. Well, no, 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 no. no. The, uh, I'm not saying the they're promising investors 50%. They what's were fine. promising investors a 10% return, which is high, obviously. But we know you can earn in excess of 10% return, for example, on bridge lending, you know, high interest lending, that, that does exist. So that's not unbelievable. What um, investors were not aware of, I don't think, is what the brokers were being paid. So that was between the broker and the platform. But if you're offering a broker 20 or 30%, how many of them are going to jump on raising you money? And this company raised a lot of money. Um, and that's why I can't remember if it was in this discussion or uh, an earlier discussion. I, I mentioned that brokers need to be held to a very high standard. Here we go. I found the article. Um, okay, guys. I've, I've sent it on the chat. Yes. Um, so we are running a bit out of time right now. Uh, regularly, we have seven minutes left. So I would say uh, let's come to the questions a little bit. Um, here's a question from also uh, Martinez. Um, maybe each platform could have discussion boards or chats where all crowdfunders could discuss about the different projects. So what do you think about this idea? I think this is something what happens in, in, in real life where people gather into some communities. So. Uh, Anatoly's mentioned that uh, their investors are using Telegram. Uh, I noticed that in Lithuania, it's popular for investors to gather in Facebook, in Facebook groups, where they're discussing the the issues about the the platforms or and, and investments. 
So it's there. Uh, if the platform should have it on their own infrastructure, I'm not sure, maybe, but it's, you know, it seems that the communities are, are solving it out uh, in their own ways. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a good way to have an um, official way, not, not Telegram or something else, mm -hmm. but you can have a discussion, an official discuss, discussion on your website. So under each project, where the guys, uh, the investors can ask questions. I saw it on some some real estate platforms also. This is more variable than. I think, I think there's a potential problem. Oh, yeah, okay. With that. Then the, yeah, this is the, sorry, Ali. I, yeah, so so yeah, we we have this Q and A uh, section okay. under under each project in our platform. So it it's there. Uh, I've seen it uh, working. Sometimes it's more active. Sometimes it's less active. But I guess it, it gets really active when something goes off. Sure, yeah. I, I think the potential problem on enabling a chat function on your platform is moderating what people say. Um, uh, I've seen, for example, on um, uh, every, I'm sure you guys know who Cedars are, they're an equity crowdfunding platform in the UK. Um, I've seen disgruntled investors, not many, uh, uh, just a handful, say some things that um, uh, are baseless um, uh, and not very nice. Um, and if you're hosting that message board on your own platform, it takes a lot to moderate. I actually think it's better to have um, these um, chat rooms elsewhere hosted by you know, bloggers where people can just be very clear about their feelings and the participants can um, uh, self-regulate. If someone's saying something that seems really outlandish, they can take a view on whether they think it's true or not. I think as a platform, if you're hosting a chat room, the reason why it's a, it can be quite dangerous is you're a regulated entity. And as a regulated entity, your communications, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you could be penalized for things that are said on your site. So I think you're opening yourself up for um, unnecessary uh, scrutiny from the regulator. I think what uh, Dali says is, uh, is, a, is an interesting point, what he raises. Never thought of it in, in that perspective. Me also. Uh, maybe another thing. Yeah, maybe another thing. You know, what what could could go into that direction is, you know, for in, it depends on on the loans that you give. So, for example, when we operate with real estate loans, uh, I know that people are uh, they feel that construction is going when they see cranes, but as soon as the facades are are built, you know, the boxes are there and work start going into the inside of the building, many people don't understand that, you know, it's, the construction is still going on. It's just It's just not about the bricks. It's now it's about the, the, the finishing inside. So, and, and sometimes these discussions might, you know, even jeopardize the project itself, just because of people get into speculations about what's happening, why, it's, why construction is not there. Or are the sales good? Or is this is the developer uh, account trustful? So it's it's really delicate. And, and as Ali mentioned at the very beginning, said you need to be very <clears throat> uh, professional with information that you that you provide and, and and you know what you're allowed to to speculate on what. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I, I hope you have some some question uh, some some time left. Maybe some minutes. Um, I have a question for Crowdesto from the community. Um, do you plan to publish audited, audited annual reports this year? No. Well, uh, I will need to kind of uh, to spe speak internally with the management uh, regarding this question. Uh, quite frankly, we have published a financial report for for the last year. Mm, uh, it is not audited. Uh, perhaps we should we should do audited one as well, of course. Okay, thanks for this uh, short answer. And the next question is uh, going to uh, British Pro to Ali. Um, 
Is it possible to everyone in Europe to invest in British Pearl? Um, what happened in terms of Brexit? Of course, <laughs> every time the Brexit question. Um, Brexit is a, a very disappointing event for me. Um, I won't spend too much time talking about that, but I'm very pro togetherness uh, and multiculturalism. Um, so the whole Brexit scenario uh, is something that I, I, I'm not very keen on uh, because it makes I feel like we're coming apart as opposed to coming together. I know e EU has its issues and we have our own issues, but um, uh, in terms of um, uh, humanity, I'd like to see more togetherness. Um, in, in, uh, from an investment perspective, addressing your question, um, we absolutely we can take investors from anywhere in the world um, if we can uh, ensure that we've ID verified them properly um, and we've confirmed that their funds are not proceeds of any crime. So we've done our KYC uh, properly and they don't appear on any sanction lists um, uh, and that we treat PEPs politically exposed people in the way that they should be treated. Um, so we we welcome investors to our site and we'll take them through a proper onboarding process. Um, in terms of soliciting uh, investment from other places in the world, uh, naturally every country has its own laws and you need to understand the marketing um, uh, rules, uh, marketing of security rules in those regions. To date, we've taken investors from 28 different countries across the world, and that was all word of mouth. Um, and so we have not fall foul, fallen foul of any regulations. But I'd certainly like to take the capital of my EU brothers, um, uh, and we will be requesting their passport details and bank statements and doing all the appropriate checks before we take their funds. And uh, obviously also checking that the investments are suitable for those investors. That's another uh, check uh, that we uh, have to provide in the UK, that they're either high net worth, sophisticated, or they understand the risks of investing through uh, our, our platform. That's something we're very um, uh, concerned about. Mm. Good point. Yeah. Just a following, following question from, from my side. Um, this bank account statements you are checking from the investors, um, how much months you are request from from the investors or what would you check in detail because it's a it's a big topic also in the, in the politics right now uh, uh yeah i personally haven't been involved in that recently myself my operations team uh, uh know technically a lot more than i do but just from memory um uh you know, obviously we know fraud can happen, you know, um, getting sure. uh, PDFs and sending them through, um, uh, you know, they can be doctored. Um, we, we know these things. There are also external services from uh, often uh, by credit reference agencies that offer ID verification services and other KYC services. So if you can find a competent one, um, we work with one in uh, the UK. Um, well, we work with a couple actually. One is on Fido. Uh, I think they offer European-wide um, uh, product now. I'm not too sure, so please don't quote me on that. Um, but um, uh, if you're not involving a third-party company to get that additional um, um, uh, feeling of comfort that um, uh, from an independent third party that specializes in these sorts of things, if you're doing it yourself, um, making sure uh, that a paper statement is sent through, obviously that will take longer. If something is delivered uh, as a, um, uh, a PDF statement online, ensuring that the funds actually have come from, uh, hit your bank, hit your client money account from the source of where that PDF says that money is coming from, that's uh, you know a good check. Um, uh, that's one of the checks that you can do. Um, the, the, the rules around, uh, uh, AML and um, ID verification um, are quite clear in the UK and quite basic. Um, uh, you know, it, it isn't a complicated thing to do. Um, if the funds uh, are sitting in a, a well-known bank um, in a well-known location that has uh, appropriate controls in place, there is a degree of reliance that you can put on the the um, uh, the processes and controls of that financial institution as well. 
Now, Ali, sorry, what about open banking solutions? I mean, do you get all those bank account statements uh, like manually uploaded to your platform? Yeah, this is, this is something that we looked at quite some time ago. Uh, actually, we set up um, our, our own API as well, open API. Um, uh, again, this isn't something I visited in, in quite some time. Open banking has... Um, uh, to my understanding, has evolved a lot in the last year. I don't know how much it's evolved during the lockdown. Um, uh, everything seems to be a, a bit slower uh, in terms of uh, to, um, how things are moving forward. But um, uh, in terms of togetherness, and I touched on that earlier, um, I think open banking is, is 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 a great concept. You know, let's all try let let all our, our technologies and operations. Um, let's try and standardize them. Let's try and talk to each other and, and share that information. I certainly believe that will assist with um, um, the AML uh, processes that banks uh, uh, need to have in place, both from a regulatory perspective, but also uh, um, a responsible perspective to prevent, prevent fraud. Yeah, and, and also you want to scale up the business. So basically uh, you want to automate as much processes uh, as you can and so basically just manually yeah. check the, the, the yeah the is uh, you know i've now been working on my own businesses in the last 10 10 years and i've always been keen on automation but there is a there is a fine balance i've learned um that uh, automate when you know that there is a market that you're going to make money from because you can spend a lot of money on automation in the in the beginning and and, and actually the business isn't there in order to support it um also uh, you know the other benefits of automation is uh, standardizing your compliance so if you know your system goes through lots of different stages to get somewhere in order to onboard a customer and that there's very little um space for human error uh, then there is a benefit of automation there so yeah i'm in favor of automation but it's got to be commercially um uh it's got to make commercial sense Guys, so we are uh, already over time. I would like to thank you for all your input about your platforms and companies and also for this uh, very active discussion. And I hope we can continue this in another discussion. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care, guys. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Same here. Bye. 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 Bye.